Right, let's get this over with. I've got a life. I actually have a life. I, I can't just do reviews all the fucking time. So here's the thing. Throughout my teenage years, there was one actor, one really great actor that I passionately and, to a certain extent, intentionally hated just to feel cool. I think we all have that one actor or maybe one actress that's you know considered as one of the best actors slash actresses of all time that we just passionately hated just because you know we we wanted that one thing that we 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 will we want to perceive as being overrated just to feel cool some people think Meryl Streep is overrated and they feel cool because because they think that way to me that actor was Humphrey Bogart and you know I always kind of went oh I saw him in Casablanca he's always ha he always has the same expression he can't do subtle facial expressions how can I emote to his character if I can't get into his facial expressions. That was my excuse. However, after watching In the Lonely Place, I've been starting to have I, I've started to have second thoughts about his acting. I, I really liked his acting in In the Lonely Place. And in the review I said that this was an anomaly in his performances. But considering the fact that I haven't seen a lot of Humphrey Bogart movies, like I've seen Casablanca, I've seen like I said, in a lonely place, I've seen Sabrina, I've seen The African Queen, I, I think I've seen like maybe five Humphrey Bogart movies, and there's so many of his films that I haven't seen, including a lot of famous ones, so I decided to really just go back into his filmography and look into his acting. Why I want to know why people consider him as this legendary actor. Is it just this... this like very plastic romanticism that we have for that age of Hollywood or it, was he really this timeless actor that we don't really give a lot of credit for these days so I decided to watch a film that I have been I've a film that I've been kind of avoiding intentionally just because I didn't like Humphrey Bogart The Big Sleep um yeah I've actually read the book which is the only Philip Marlowe novel that I've ever read, but, you know, I, I knew of the movie. And it's kind of weird that I'm finally seeing the movie now. Um, now, here's my, here's just a personal opinion of mine. I'm not a big fan of film noir films of the 40s, um, mostly because, I, I mean, I know it's, like, directed by Howard Hawks. It must be great, but most of the film noirs from that era seems to have, they seem to have these same cliches that I can't stand, like the rushed, the very, the very rushed scenes that are edited, like, just forced in there, um, um, the very, the very intense lack of in-depth motivation, like, it, the good guys are just good and the bad guys are just bad, they don't really have this really moral, very human motivation, motivation that really pushes them towards what they, what they're doing, and usually, and this is a problem for most of the films from the early ages of Hollywood, they, but mostly with film noirs, they really feel like a play. I, it really feels like I'm just watching a play. In other words, a lot of the 40s film noir films are kind of still stuck in that 30s Hollywood aesthetic before, like, C Citizen Kane and The Great Dictator came in to, like, you know, revolutionize everything in American cinema. Um, but that's just how I see it. And I sort of expected all of that in The Big Sleep. And admittedly, um, although I didn't love it, I did get something more out of it. Now, like, the second the credits start, the first thing you see, these two shadows with smoking cigarettes. Like, that's basically, like, how we can just, like, summarize the film noir films from the 40s. Shadows and cigarettes. And it just oozes the aesthetic of the genre. And all these stylistic cliches kind of come in a single package for you to understand in the form of the character, Philip Marlowe. Um, the icon himself. Now... Here's the thing, Philip Marlowe as a character, when it comes to his traits, he is a very generic film noir detective character. You know, he's he's got that no bullshit attitude. He's great with the ladies. And he's got this sense of humor that clearly shows that he doesn't care what other people think about him. In many ways, he's kind of this prototypical detective of this genre. But here's the thing, he's just 
just a bit too well written for me to find him to be like really generic and tiring. Like he's he's got this is one of the most quotable characters that I've ever seen in film history. Like like the I get cuter every minute line, or she tried to sit on my lap while I was standing up. Like there are so many. I've written down like seven to eight lines, and I just I I I would love to quote every single one of them. But, you know, obviously, we gotta talk about other stuff, too. Like, he's just so well-written. He's so witty. He's got this really modern sense of sarcasm there. And this is where I really need to talk about Humphrey Bogart's acting. He's really good at portraying sarcasm. Like, I was never able to find that in, like, Casablanca. Not even in Sabrina, but here, like, he's really great at being sarcastic. Um, he's really good at portraying the stern demeanor of a serious detective as well. Um, he's also really smooth, and one of the most interesting thing, thing that I found about this performance is that in he, with this film, he is actually really good at subtle for, um, facial facial expressions. Like he, like the way he went in every single scene where he's talking with the Lauren Bacall character of Vivian, like you can see him just acting all all over the place with his facial expressions and the, these subtle eye rolls or these sudden like nods that really kind of adds to his sarcasm. Um, but even though I'm like really praising, praising um, Humphrey Bogart's, Bogart's acting here all, all, all over the place, um, Lauren Bacall was the one that really surprised me. Now, here's the thing, yet again, I don't hate Lauren Bacall. Um, I just never knew much about her. Like I knew that she was married to Humphrey Bogart uh, I know that she's, like, one of the iconic actresses of this era, but I haven't seen a lot of her movies. Like, the one, that, the only one that I've seen her in is How to Marry a Millionaire, the, the, the like, the really stupid Marilyn Monroe movie that's... I, I mean, I like that movie, but it's, like, clearly just for laughs and just for entertainment. It's just so stupid. And, like, she's, like, the one serious character in that film. Like... That's the only thing I kn know Lauren Bacall from. So seeing her in this movie was like a revelation to me. But here's the thing. Here's why I think she gives the best performance in the movie. Well, first of all, we, we kind of need to talk about how Vivian is written. You know, he's got... He's kind of the female version of Merlot. With a shaky sec secret, obviously. Because, you know, if you know the story of this movie, you kind of know wh why she's acting this way. You know, she, she she's really able to... She's written in a way where it's, like, the writer's obviously trying to balance the, the very witty, strong female image that's kind of, you know, akin to, like, um, Catherine Hepburn's characters, or, but, you know, she, they're all obviously, obviously trying to add this golden age sense of glamour to the character as well, and sometimes they kind of play humorously with the sexual tension between, um, Humphrey Bogart's character and Laura Bac Lauren Bacall's character, the, the obvious choice for this would be the famous scene where, like, Vivian scratches her, scratches her leg, um, and this kind of adds this human, this very insecure, flawed element to the character that makes her much more real, but here, here's why I think, um, Lauren Bacall's acting is better than Bogart's acting in this movie, like, unlike Bogart's Merlot, um, a lot of this character portrayal, a lot of this performance kind of comes from her acting, a lot of the character traits doesn't really come from the dialogue. Like, Marlowe's character is dialogue-heavy. The way the character's built up is very dialogue-heavy, and Humphrey Bogart's kind of there to be, to be the vessel for the dialogue. The dialogue creates the character. Vivian is the total opposite. The dialogue does not create the character, mostly because Vivian needs to keep secrets. So she doesn't... Like, sh she's supposed to not talk as much as Marlowe. So, to c create her character, the acting needs to be just on par. The acting needs to be basically as good as Marlowe's dialogue. And Lauren Bacall delivers every single goddamn scene. Like, her acting sells the performance and the character rather than the screenplay. And these two kind of opposite ways of creating characters and, like, being becoming the vessels for becoming vessels for the dialogue, they, these two performance kinda come, performances kind of come together to give us one of the best portrayal of a romance that's kind of like knee-deep, maybe like waist-deep in dark waters. I don't know, like, I thought that this was going to be like a really generic film noir romance, but clearly it's extremely well thought out, it's impeccably written, and the acting is like... It, it's kind of amazing that Lauren Bacall never won one Oscar. Okay, there's... Here's the thing. There's going to be an announcement from some guy that's working in the apartment 
of some apartment complex over there. I'm gonna close the door because I don't. I, I'm like I'm nine. I'm ten minutes into this review. I don't want to be disturbed. I'm in the zone. I'm gonna. <laughs> Ugh. You gotta remember that English is still my second language. I need to be in the zone. I need my mind needs to be in this place. In order for me to make in incoherent sentences, not incoherent sentences. Um, and there's a great sense of detective work throughout the film as well. Like, and but what I liked about the detec detective work blah, 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 is that it's really dark. Like, the, and it's really also very smartly portrayed. Like, like there's this great interrogation scene where like Marlowe's trying to interrogate this character named Joe, and the character Joe constantly like. He, he's constantly retrieving his gaze from Marlowe, and Marlowe and Humphrey Bogart slowly follows the character. You know, he follows that retreating gaze, and you know it adds that real sense of detective work in that interrogation scene. And the film genuinely feels sinister. Like a lot of the gangster movies or the film noir movies from the '30s and the '40s, kind of has this really plastic sense of sinister, sinister like maliciousness you know you don't really feel like these people are really trying to kill these guys but here like especially with the character um lash canino La is that n name lash canino like, like there's this really weird almost david lynchian type of character in this movie that kind of goes like he's basically trying to do the little caesar performance in this movie like he's going man see I'm, 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 and then but the way he does it and the dialogue that's written for the character is just so beyond maliciousness that he, he kind of stands out in the movie because he, he's like the scariest character in the whole film. Is the announcement done? Yes, it is. This room is way too hot for, for me to close this goddamn door. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to the, the, con the pros of this movie is that there's this one scene that I really need to talk about. Now, usually... In these movies from the 30s, the 40s, and maybe the 50s, usually in these film noir films, there's this one music scene. There's one little musical scene. They, not like not like. There's this one character who's singing in that one scene in every movie, and usually it feels very forced. It feels very awkward. It literally ruins the flow of the film. But here, they use it amazingly well. Like um, so, Marlowe goes to this. Um, casino run by uh, this character named Eddie Mars, who's a very important character in this film, and he sees Vivian singing in this room. And then they see, they kind of get some eye contact from each other, and this scene kind of proceeds, and three things stand out from this scene. One, it kind of shows off a different side of the Vivian character. She sings. And to a lot of people, that might not add a lot, but to me, that kind of added this, again, this sense of humanity to this character. Like, singing and music in general kind of adds this humanity to any film or any character, and this is a very good example of that. Um, and it builds more, like, great sexual tension, you know, in which, you know, gives both, both actors kind of a time to shine. Like, there's, in that short scene, the way they just talk to each other with their gaze and the way they just talk to each other with the way they look at each other and the way they just with like slight gestures it's just amazing acting and again it builds up a slight part of a grand scheme that eddie mars the, the character who's running the casino is trying to build and um spoiler alert he's the, his, he's the villain just so you know and so like a scene that could have easily been just like a throwaway music scene is used to add to the character, to the acting, and the story. Like, this is really rare for a film from this era, so it was personally surprising for me. But now we need to get into the flaws of this movie, and unfortunately there's qu quite a bit. Maybe it's just me. Um, there are certain scenes where they use... This room is way too fucking hot. There are certain scenes where they use, like, really silly old-school Disney cartoon sound effects. Like, there's this one scene where this bad guy's, like, running away and he jumps over a fence. And you kind of hear that boing sound where, where like, and they'll use that sound effect in, like, old Disney cartoons where, when, like, bunnies are hopping over, over fences. Like, it's silly. And it's used in a scene that needs to be kind of serious and sinister and it just gets you out of it. 
But the main problem that I have with this movie really is the first half of the film, and mostly the story. I hated how the mystery was structured in the first half. And I hated how Marlowe kind of needed to, like, become an exposition machine at the end for the audience to understand what the hell's going on. Like, like it's a smart film. Don't get me wrong. It's, a, it's clearly a smart film. But like a lot of smart people, the film is quite scatterbrained. So the first, ha the first half is just, like, there's, like, so many things going on all over the place. And thankfully, they kind of all intertwine together and... In the end, it becomes this coherent mystery. But in the first half, you don't know what the fuck's going on. There are far too many characters in too many different locations. And they introduce characters like third, a third way into the movie. Like, it's too complicated. And too many things are happening. Too many things are just... Just, just happen out of the fucking blue. And then, like, around the half mark, they start tying things together. And it starts making sense. So, like, the last half is actually much better than the first half. Just because the first half is just, like, throwing, like, story story bits here and there and everywhere. And at the end, they kind of all connect together. But, like I said, the first half is beyond scatterbrain. It's structured terribly. But that's just me. Maybe some people would see this movie and say, hey... I understood what was going on from start to finish, and I'm the stupid one. Um, that might be the case, but hey. I didn't like it. I, I didn't like the, how it was structured, and this is my review, so fuck off. Um, and that's about it. That's the big sleep. Um, I think I'm getting... I think I'm getting rid of my little Humphrey Bogart stone face prejudice away from myself, so... Maybe this is progress. I still haven't seen the Maltese Falcon. Um, at least I've seen like half of it, but I haven't seen the rest of it. And I I I need to see the Treasure of Sierra Madre, Madre. So like I haven't seen like the John Houston ones that he was in. So hopefully they're better than this. Like I didn't look again. I didn't hate the Big Sleep. I think it's a really good movie. It's just that the first half I just I just I I just didn't like it. But that's about it. Uh, the Big Sleep. Blah, blah, blah. That, that, that's a review. Bye.